Well, good evening, everybody. It's very nice to have such a full um, hall of what apparently are excited and animated people ready to listen to what I hope will be a, a great um, panel discussion on the global governance of migration. Well, that's our subject, but is there much to talk about? Um, is there much of it around? Oh, because we all know about bodies like the United Nations High Commission of Refugees and others in the field of migration studies will know about organizations like the International Organization of Migration and the migration-related work of the International Labor Organization. A few years ago, in his time, Kofi Annan was very keen on trying to promote the thought that global migration should be or could be governed in a slightly more rational way than it is at the moment, and he set up something called the <coughs> Global Commission on International Migration. And then again, we have UN high-level dialogues on migration and development and global forums on migration and development. So there's quite a bit of, um, there are quite a few of these organizations around. They're rather shadowy organizations. And I suppose it's a legitimate question to ask um, whether this uh, really amounts to a bag of beans or, you know, there's something serious happening here. Do we really have significant, um, a significant amount of regulation or uh, somewhat analogous to, let us say, the governance implied by the World Trade Organization? We all know, of course, that the nation state is fiercely protective of its rights to police its borders though there are very significant uh, exceptions to nation-state control over borders, and one's thinking particularly of regional bodies, not only like the EU, but others as well, where there are some restricted but important um, uh, rights for free movement. The one that's on everybody's mind at the moment is the regional um, movement uh, between different members of the EU. So. I think one might say, on the whole, although there are those very important issues like the EU to discuss, we nonetheless have to recognise that nation states have been fiercely protective of their borders. They've really, on the whole, failed or lost control of global, com global flows of capital, information and goods, but they're hanging in there in respect of immigration. Indeed, um, as um, two people argue, it could have been me at some point, the, the principal purpose of the state seems to have become to erect a frontier of identity to, as it were, police that border. Well, we have four speakers to address these issues and to give us their own take on global governance of migration. The rules are pretty simple. They've each got 15 minutes each. This shouldn't be any great... Um, hazard for them because not only are they eminent, but they're also sort of thoroughbred. So when I push the starting button, they will immediately leap off and in 15 minutes, um, they will complete the course. And if they don't, I shall flash this high bit of equipment to them, which is stop, please. And if they don't see it or seem to be ignoring that, I'll do it to you, and you can all do this as well, and so we, we, we will collectively manage to stop a runaway horse. Um, now, we've got um, uh, some thanks before we kick off. Thanks first to Kellogg College, who are sponsoring the event. It's a wonderful college, um, great meals there, by the way, um, and you're all invite invited to drinks afterwards. You need to simply move from this event to the book signing, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, if you want to buy a book, sign, have a book signed, and then move along the Banbury Road about 200 yards up on your right is Kellogg College. Uh, Kellogg has been very helpful to migration scholarship in the university and has decided to make international migration a key theme. So the event is one of the um, events that they sponsor in terms of 
debate, networking, discussion of new ideas, and just friendship around the food and drink uh, for scholars interested in migration. I also have to thank the publishers who have displayed copies of the books of our various uh, thoroughbred authors. They are all out on, uh, as, you, as you leave this room. And I should particularly acknowledge Princeton University Press who've also uh, contributed to um, this event. Um, later on, as you get towards um, Kellogg, you will also see displays of the three migration centers. We have no less than three um, migration centers, uh, uh, no fewer than three migration centers. I mean, some people say, well, I, I, in fact, a, a college head said to me, why do you have all these centers of migration? And of course, at the time, I didn't, my riposte didn't come to me. I should have said, why do you have all these colleges? I mean, we can certainly get, get rid of some of them, but um, uh, we, we have a, a center for um, uh, migration policy and society compass, we have an international migration institute, and we have a refugee studies um, uh, center, and we all get on terribly well with each other, and we are a community of, ref of, of, of migration scholars who do a lot of work in common. The centers will have a display of Kellogg, and you're all in invited to come. Uh, toilets are downstairs, if you can find your way through the hazards, if there's a um, uh, otherwise, just hang on. Uh, uh, <laughs> if there is a fire, you follow the little green, the green man. Now, we, we've got an order of play. Paul Collier, Dan Golden, Catherine Costello, then Martin Roos. There have been quite extensive descriptions of our authors. There's a short one up there, and there have been e-posters and so on. So I'm not going to repeat who they are, they're all eminent, they're all you know, well, well known in their field. But So rather than do that, I'm going to ask Paul Collier to step up to the plate. And the, it now, we now start the tickoff at 10 past, so he's got 15 minutes from now, and I'll wave it at them. Thank you. Right, thanks very much. Um, I, uh, I think that the debates on migration, especially in Britain, have been pretty muddled and pretty biased. Um, a lot of posturing advocacy on each side. Um, and in writing Exodus, what I tried to do was not tell you what to think about migration, but tell you how to think about it, provide you with the analytic building blocks. Um, and you can use those analytic building blocks to reach different conclusions. Um, but I think the building blocks are the vital blocks for thinking about the subject. Um, let's start with just clearing away some ground. Um, migration is not all of a part with globalization. Right? Um, the idea that uh, because we're globalizing, we're just going to get more and more migration. Um, and we'll all end up as a global soup, uh, is just silly. Um, the, um, um, what we're seeing is a temporary disequilibrium of epic proportions in which um, until poor countries catch up with rich countries, there's a, a big incentive for people to move from poor countries and come and live in rich countries. Um, 200 years ago, there wasn't that big income gap. Um, in 100 years' time, there won't be that income gap. Income gaps are the big drivers of migration. And so as countries catch up, migration will slow down. Um, simple evidence for that is that if we look at migration amongst rich countries, migration amongst the OECD, um, as a proportion of the OECD population, there's actually less of it now than there was 50 years ago. The world has globalized like mad. Trade flows, ideas flows, um, but people are actually within the OECD more inclined to stay put than they were. Right? So there's, there's no long-term move to global soup. Um, we've just got a temporary disequilibrium, um, which will which will end in a hundred years' time. There'll be Nigeria full of Nigerians. You know, there'll be etc. etc. Um, and uh, 
Um, so we shouldn't muddle it up as some inevitable feature of globalization, it just isn't. Um, the, um, I would start with some effects on host countries, then effects on um, countries of origin, and then turn a bit to global governance. So, effects on host countries. They, they matter because it's host countries that have the control point on migration. Other than North Korea, nobody has control points on leaving, um, but most countries have controls on entry. Um, and that, there's, there's a very big analytic and ethical difference between preventing people leave and preventing people coming. Um, the, uh, so if we look at the effects on host countries, I mean, I'm an economist, but let me tell you that the economic effects on indigenous populations are to a first approximation trivial. There's a lot of fuss about them, um, but they're just tiny. Right? I mean, no country in its right mind, in my view, would set its policy on migration um, from these sort of trivial economic effects. Um, you know, if you want to be like Japan, have no migrants, um, you can be the richest country on earth. If you want not to have migrants, but grow fast, you can be China. Um, or you can be Dubai, which is, you know, nearly all migrants done very well. So the, the, the economic effects are just trivial. The, what matters for host societies is that migration affects diversity. Um, and, um, and that's an externality. Migrants don't think about that, but that's, that's the effect. Um, and um, we know quite a lot about the effects of diversity on um, sort of long-term economic performance, and more importantly on the sort of social, three social features of trust, uh, of cooperation, and of generosity. Um, and the, the bottom line is that some, diverse, some diversity is better than no diversity, um, but you can also have too much diversity as a happy medium. The societies I work on, I, I work on Africa, basically, and most of the countries I work on, um, every sort of development economist would say the problem is they've got too much diversity. Now, if there's weak national identity, strong subnational identities, very fragmented, so very low levels of trust, very low levels of uh, cooperation, very low levels of generosity beyond the family. So that's just bog standard development economics. You can have too much diversity, then you can have too little. There's a happy medium. Yeah. I can't tell you how much diversity is just right, Goldilocks diversity. That's for each society to decide. You know? um, but, uh, but that's what each society has to decide. How much diversity do we want? And then you, then you set your migration policy according to that. Um, the um, final building block on hosts is really important, which is that um, migration tends to accelerate. There's a very simple economic reason for that, which is, again, really sort of nailed down now, but only recently nailed down. And that is that you know, migration is fundamentally, predominantly an economic decision driven by an income gap. Uh, but it's an investment. A migrant moves from a poor country to a rich one is costly. They're making an investment. So the people that tells you, first of all, the people who migrate are not the poorest. The poorest people, the poor people can't afford that sort of investment. So it's middle income people from poor countries that migrate. Um, why does it tend to accelerate? Because the big factor that lowers the costs of migration is having a welcoming diaspora of people from your society who've already come and formed a community and uh, and that lowers the costs. And so migration feeds the diaspora, diaspora feeds migration, and so migration accelerates. That's kind of one of the fundamental economic features of migration. And that, if you put that together with the fact that some diversity is better than no diversity, a lot of diversity is worse than some diversity, um, you're going to have to have immigration controls. Right? Controls are not a, a vestige of a racist history, their migration controls are the future. 
um, for all high income societies because otherwise migration will accelerate to the point at which uh, they get too much diversity. So um, that's just, to my mind, you know, the sort of logical corollary of the key building, analytic building blocks. Um, the, um, let me turn to the effects on countries of origin, which is the thing that really motivated me to, to write Exodus, because to say I've, my sort of life's work has been about trying to get poor countries to, uh, to catch up. And so what are the effects of emigration on the ability of countries to catch up? Um, and there are um, the various effects. There's a remittance effect. Um, I don't think that's very important, really, because um, the typical emigrant sends back about $1,000 per year. Um, but the typical emigrant is a is a worker who, if they'd stayed put, would have produced two a thousand dollars a day a year isn't very much. It's you know two dollars and a bit a day. So you don't have to be very productive in order to produce that in your country of origin. So um, moving from poor to rich produces these big numbers of remittance flows, most of which go to China and India. So, but. Um, uh, but, but, it's, but it's a small economic effect on the whole. I mean, it, it has some beneficial features. It's a bit like it, it's a sort of safety net. Um, but it's not a decisive force for, for, for catching up. Um, more important are um, the brain gain or brain drain effects. And this is an area that's been very heavily studied in the last few years. We know a lot more about this than we did even five years ago. Um, and it's, um, in essence, it's, uh, it comes up with the same sort of answer as the immigration to host countries. That is to say, some immigration is better than no immigration, and you can have too much as well as too little. Um, some immigration is better than none, because um, the chance of being able to get out and earn a high income is a lure to people getting education. So it increases the incentive for people to get education. Um, in, a, in a society which has a low rate of emigration, like China or India, uh, that, in, that small chance, if you get education, you could hit the jackpot of a job in America, uh, induces a lot more people to get education than leave the country. So it's a brain gain. Um, but in put small countries, um, where there's a lot of people leave, it's the opposite effect. It's a brain drain. Um, so um, economists have recently studied this. We can say, here's the countries which have brain gain, basically the big ones, like India and China. And here's the countries that have brain drain, um, basically small countries. And if you're small and not doing very well, then you hemorrhage your educated people. Like Haiti, about 85% of the educated young people leave. And that's kind of debilitating. Um, what we've not studied very well yet is beyond just formal education. Um, we know that people differ according to motivation, internalization, and that sort of thing. And there's certainly some evidence that it's the more motivated people who leave. Um, and that's, that's not a good thing. Um, if you move all the fairy godmothers from the poorest societies to the richest, that's very nice for the richest, but it's actually catastrophic for the poorest. So, um, so it's, it's not a case of just sort of the, the more the merrier with, with immigration. Um, there's a final effect of uh, migration, which is feeding back onto which is the most important thing potentially, which is the feedback onto political and social attitudes in the country's origin. Um, and there's some evidence that there is some positive feedbacks. Um, for example, there's some evidence that uh, fertility decisions, people come to 
rich societies where that people have lower fertility, and that feeds back, that influences fertility decisions back home. There's also evidence on um, uh, political attitudes and political participation, but the, where we've got clearest evidence of benefits is people who come as students and then go back. That is unambiguously super beneficial. People go back with skills and they go back with attitudes which are beneficial for their whole society. So the thing that we really ought to be scaling up is temporary migration for education from poor countries, and then people go back. Um, what does all this mean for the global governance of migration? Um, we've got to make a sharp distinction between the rights of, uh, of migrants and the right to migrate. Um, in my view, there's, there's no global right to migrate. In fact, if you think about it, such a right would be both ridiculous and, I would argue, <coughs> catastrophic for the poorest countries. Um, uh, they're very important that we have rights for immigrants, so that's a, a different matter. Um, the, um, we clearly can't leave the as it were, the, the control point to the migrants themselves because of these powerful externalities, both on host societies and on countries of origin. So it's perfectly legitimate to say, we're not just leaving it to migrants can do whatever they want. Um, the, um, I think it's difficult to get global governance, not just in the sense that it's politically hard, but um, on the whole, it's a good reason for having the rights set country by country by hosts because they vary so much with good reason. You know, Japan has basically decided it wants to stay Japanese. Fair enough, you know. It should. Um, uh, Dubai has basically decided that um, the original Dubaians don't want to work, but they like other people to do it for them. Um, you know, but, I don't find that very tasteful, but that's what they do. Um, uh, Canada is an immigrant society and so has a very structured policy suitable for a, a society that's a big immigration society. Um, Botswana um, um, had a policy of encouraging people to come and work and now changing that. It's actually very, very, very restrictive now. It's a small society, it doesn't want a lot of immigrants in it. Um, uh, so let me close with one right that I haven't seen much discussed, but I think is a really important global right, um, and that is the right of immigrants to return to their host society. Um, that's the right I would like to see, uh, and I'd like to start with Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to be here and to um, see that so many people are interested in this absolutely vital debate. And um, like Paul and, and others here, uh, I've worked on this issue because I think it is both very important for development uh, and particularly for poor people, but also because I think uh, the debate is extremely muddled. Uh, and so, uh, although I don't agree with uh, much of what Paul says, uh, and I certainly don't agree with his analytic foundations. Um, I do think that it is vital that we do this work uh, and that you engage in this debate and that we try and uh, find clarity. The two key points that I don't agree with uh, are first that this is somehow some temporary disequilibrium. It, depending how one defines temporary, of course, 50,000 years would be about how long there's been mass migration for. Um, and certainly if one looks at the great books like that of Hatton and Williamson on the age of mass migration in the 19th century, slavery of course, in the 15th and 16th centuries and other periods in history, uh, it's clear that what we're experiencing now is nothing like uh, a different levels of flow as a share of the world's population even if the absolute numbers are much greater. It also of course depends on what one defines migration as. If it's the crossing of borders, well then very obviously the fact we've doubled the number of countries in the last hundred years uh, leads to a very sort of de definitional basis for this whole concept. 
Uh, so the breakup of the Soviet Union, for example, uh, perforce uh, leads to, to mass migration. Uh, so this is a, in, in a, one of the many muddled areas. The other thing I don't agree, the Atlantic Foundation uh, is on diversity, having some sort of absolute that one can measure. Uh, one only has to look at the wonderful cities of London, 42% migration, Toronto 50%, Silicon Valley many places, 60-70%, Dubai 98%. Uh, to um, get some sense that if there was a tolerance level that was exceeded, um, that's difficult to discern. And the reason I'm interested in migration is because this has led uh, not only to me being here, and all of us, of course, being here, uh, but the idea that there's some dis diversity level which suddenly leads to societies to fracture uh, is deeply personal, because my family thought they were part of a tiny minority in Vienna, uh, they had played bridge with their neighbors for 25 years uh, and thought they were upright members of the Viennese community until one day their neighbors shot them uh, and my grandfather was taking them out of the Gestapo. So what that level might be of accepting and tolerance of society, I think, is not about numbers. There's some many other forces and it's about ideology and it's about what academics are able to do to try and help inform societies as we go forward. Uh, and that's what I've tried to do with Exceptional People and the other books as well that have touched on this, which is um, Divided Nations and Globalization for Development. So this is a very important debate. And I, I absolutely welcome my friend Paul's entry into it because he always uh, helps to clarify our thinking. Uh, and I also welcome those of the other panelists tonight. On the topic, let me just quickly give five points regarding how I believe the global governance of migration uh, should possibly evolve, mindful of the fact that this is an orphan of the system. So these are long processes. The WTO took 50 years to evolve. The World Health Organization took 80 years to evolve. And if we have as a goal the progressive realization of migrants' rights and better flow, a more orderly flow, uh, a more development-oriented flow of migrants, one should certainly not expect this to happen overnight. But the question is, should one have it as an ambition? Is, the, is it a realistic ambition to um, expect a, an organization, something like the WTO or other, that would govern migrant rights? And I believe it is absolutely appropriate because I believe migration is at the very heart of everything that is to do um, with not only development, but economic progress, and particularly for developing countries. So the more that we can place this into an international framework, I believe the more progress we can make. The five areas I would want to see as part of this are first, the extending of transnational rights, uh, the pensions and benefits, uh, huge variation in pension portability. That is often a trap for people. It prevents them going home. Uh, and just two neighboring countries like Morocco and Algeria have totally different rights, with one allowing full pension portability uh, from the European Union and the other not. Makes a big, big difference. Remittances, which Paul's touched upon, I think it is much more significant. It might only be $1,000, but if you're the Sutu worker uh, in South Africa, it's the difference between life and death for 50% of the population, perhaps, of Lesotho. Uh, so these things really do matter a great deal. And there's many countries where remittances flows are well over a third of the incomes, and certainly disposable incomes. And because remittances tend to be counter-cyclical, uh, in other words, you get more of them when you need them more uh, from your loved ones and from your families, extended families, and they matter particularly for resilience. Uh, so this is extremely significant. There are lots of cases of people looking after there are others in times of ill health, in elderly periods of their lives, etc., when they cannot be productive. So it's not just the absolute or even lifelong amounts, it's when they come, how they come, that's extremely significant. And then the third area where I believe we should extend transnational rights is the political rights of people. Uh, in other words, are you able to vote in your home country? Under what terms and conditions uh, do we allow multiple political affiliations, uh, etc.? This is extremely significant, and the global rules on this are uneven, uh, to say the very, very least. The UK, for example, allowing it across the Commonwealth, but not amongst other countries, uh, etc. These are very significant things, and they affect the way one goes back and identifies and pulls out to be right about this, the extent to which migrants do or do not lead to progressive realization of their home societies. 
The second broad area is the promotion of social and economic advancement. Foreign certification of qualifications is absolutely essential. Even across Europe, we're still struggling to recognize our degrees, uh, to recognize health qualifications, etc. This again is often used as a barrier. Uh, closed shop trade unions use it often to keep out uh, people, to keep narrow the confines of their workers. But certification is vital in all areas. I would see that I know we're going to hear more about asylum and refugees. This is absolutely essential and it also needs to be resolved prior to some of the big debates that will be accelerated uh, by the whole climate and other debates that will come from more and more natural disasters as we go forward, which there will no doubt be. Um, the policies to distribute asylum seekers is absolutely vital. It's desperately unfortunate for Lapidusia or parts of Greece that they happen by accidents of geography to be the gateways for North Africa, for Syria, for Sudanese and for other refugees. This absolutely has to be a Europe-wide policy, and it needs to be a global policy. We cannot allow accidents of history for the Maltese, Lampedusians or others to face this, and I think that needs to be part of a global agenda. And then, of course, best practice swapping of ideas. The third area is providing a, a wider umbrella for legal migration. About two to four million uh, migrants uh, are undocumented per year across borders, we think. Again, very difficult to even say. The normalization of these has been shown, and there's great evidence coming out of the USA now on the whole normalization and documentation debate in the US as what it does, bringing people into the tax system, bringing them into the social security system, bringing them into the criminal justice system, bringing them into surveillance and other concern systems and when people become documented societies do regard them in higher regard of course they can contribute and they can also be kicked out uh, the questions of how one does this the thresholds etc need to be sorted out and then as paul mentioned tmp temporary migration programs absolutely vital as my former colleague uh, and co-author alan winters has discussed a small change in TMP of 3% would lead to global gains of well over 300 billion, far greater than trade liberalization as a means of bringing economic benefit. The fourth area is the combating of abuse, discrimination and trafficking. Uh, perhaps that's obvious, I won't spend too much time on it, but clearly because of the failure of treaty and law and governance, migrants tend in all their forms from sex trafficking uh, all the way through to that what we're seeing in the Mediterranean to be amongst the most abused people in populations and clearly that requires an international rule of law. And the fifth area is in improving research and data. It's absolutely shocking to see how little data there is and how we can all disagree on things that we should know about. So it's not only about the funding of more research, it's about common definition. What we call migrants differs from societies to society. No common definitions in many of the discussions so creating common databases, improving the metrics, improving this is what the uh, Center for Global Development in Washington after a Blue Ribbon Commission called the biggest blind spot in our view of the world economy. And I would certainly agree with that. It's a vital area and I believe that improvements in global governance could go a long way. In this regard, our new, our new report now for the long term, which Pascal Lamy chaired, uh, which many great people were commissioners of and which reported about a month ago, has some practical suggestions as how you build coalitions, not going through one step to an international uh, governance agenda. I think that would be naive, the ambitious, but how you build this. The International Organization for Migration, IOM, is a great organization, about 150 members. It does certain things well but it does not do the things that I've just mentioned, the five points at all. It's not its mandate, it's not a UN organization, it does not include some key players like China. So how you use these and other bodies like the Global Forum for Migration and Development as building blocks, I believe, is something that we need to work with. Thank you. Thank you very much to, the, to Martin and to the speakers. Um, I'm the token lawyer. Um, uh, there's, there's so much to say in so many different perspectives, and I think one of the main difficulties is the phenomenon of migration is just too many different things to really talk about them in one forum. Um, and obviously that's something that is reflected in the global governance of migration. Um, but maybe just to reflect, first of all, a little bit on the opening contributions and then talk about global governance. Um, I think one of the things when we talk about migration 
Um, and it's very clear from Paul's opening statement is that when we talk about migration law, we're assuming that that law has a controlling function. So there has been an assumption made that migration law effectively controls migration. Um, but that's really all that that is. Um, and as a lawyer, I don't really have the skills to test that assumption. Uh, but thankfully, I have colleagues in Oxford and elsewhere who do. And unsurprisingly, as in lots of areas of law, migration law, particularly laws that seek to control migration, often have very unanticipated consequences, and certainly not always the consequences that they're held out to have. Um, but when we posit this question, obviously, one of the things that is very apparent if we ask the question, well, does this law meet its stated aim of restricting migration, um, is, well, what's the counterfactual? Do we know about, enough about the situation if there were more liberal migration <coughs> controls? Um, but we have lots of examples that we can look at where migration controls have either, where there just haven't been migration controls, and we look at what happens when we do institute them, or we can look at great experiments in free movement like within the EU. And one of, I think, the most interesting things when we look at those empirical examples is that under conditions of very liberal or no migration control, the right to return of which Paul spoke is actually most often exercised. In other words, what we know is that in the absence of migration control, circularity becomes the norm rather than settlement under some conditions. Um, now, that's something that colleagues at IMI have investigated, and there's a wonderful ongoing project um, looking at the impact of migration policies, um, looking across 38 host countries. And the, some of the findings are startling and very interesting, and I, I commend it to you, and it's going to be very interesting to see the full fruits of their analysis. Um, but wearing a slightly different hat, um, I often think, well, if it's not migration law that exactly regulates migration, um, and if migration law has a lot of unanticipated consequences, which I'll return to in a moment, then what about other aspects of the law of the land? And I think what we always have to build into this discussion is, is a question about labor markets and labor market regulation. Um, because if you want one example, think about the example of the UK. Um, when it, as we know, this has become a real cause celeb, opened its labor market to migrants from the AA, Central and Eastern European countries, leading to larger numbers of migrants from those countries coming to the UK. Well, an opposite comparison would be with Sweden, which made the identical policy decision, and only 50,000 people went to Sweden, even though Sweden was equally prosperous. But one of the major differences in Sweden is that there's a heavily regulated labor market it still has strong collective bargaining structures. And employers just didn't see any particular advantage in, in hiring a, a migrant over a domestic worker. Now, you could say that's a bad thing for migrants, and that would be part of the discussion I think we would need to have. But from what we do know, and there is quite a considerable evidence base on this, you know, how a state chooses to regulate its labor market has a huge impact on um, how many uh, migrant workers are going to be present. Um, and that's before we even discuss questions about enforcement of labor laws, irregular migration, um, and the types of labor markets that draw um, a lot of migrant um, labor. So those are just two observations about the effects of the law and the importance of, not of, of, of building into a discussion about migration law, also questions about labor law and other aspects of domestic law and policy that clearly have an impact on migration. Um, I want to also just as a reminder, because I find it difficult to discuss migration in the abstract, to, to just ask ourselves the question of, well, what counts as migration? Um, once upon a time, if a man married a foreign woman, that transmitted his nationality just by the very act of marriage. So that notion of spousal migration as something that is subject to the state's regulation is a relatively new idea. And forms of migration become visible and become problematized and subject to legal regulation for different reasons. But I think we should bear that in mind. There are types of migration like intra-company transferees of global companies that are subject to very, very liberal visa regimes or none. And I think in our discussion about migration, we have to ask ourselves, well, what forms of move transboundary movement are we talking about? But one area in which there is, I think, quite a stunning ethical consensus across liberal nationalists like David Miller to communitarians like Michael Walzer to global justice folks 
is that you can't even begin to justify a state system without protecting refugees, without protecting those who are forced to migrate. And interestingly, certainly amongst ethical writers, the assumption is always that our formal definitions of refugees are not over, but rather they are underprotective. So including my colleague Alex Betts, who's written of survival migrants, Matthew Gibney, who writes about the necessity for a broader conception of refugeehood also. And an awful lot of the energies states put into regulating migration actually just fail to or preclude access to protection. So, I mean, I don't think we need reminders of the um, events of the 3rd of October in Lampedusa to understand that we have made it extremely difficult to access protection for those who are most desperate. Um, and if you want to lose sleep, I suggest you read about the situation in Eritrea. And Eritrea was, after all, the nationality <coughs> of most of the migrants who, joined, who drowned on that occasion. Um, and, or also read about their other um, point of um, flight, which could take them through the Sinai to Egypt. So in these kinds of cases, people are making calculations based on desperation. Um, and the things that we do ostensibly to control migration clearly are controlling access to the people that we all agree should be afforded protection. Um, so I think when we look at um, those tensions between ethical commitments, which are also legal commitments, and realities, then we have to look at global, global governance in that vein. So yes, for refugees, we have a very, very highly evolved legal set of rules defining who deserves protection. Um, but we don't have a set of rules defining who should afford that protection. So there's a significant gap and a massive, I guess, coordination problem. Um, and even within the context of the EU, trying to agree rules about the distribution of responsibilities for affording protection is completely logjammed in, in a very depressing way. Um, and I think there are then tensions between what states do in these fora and then other contexts in which you have less formal forms of global governance. Um, so there are plenty of regional consultative and global consultative processes where states, and in this context we really mean governments, share know-how on how to control borders, preclude access to protection, and so on. Um, so in terms of global governance and thinking about building, and I very much share um, Ian's sort of, I guess, faith in the progressive move to create and formalize greater institutions around international migration, I think there are certain forms of global governance that we should be suspicious of. I think we should always be suspicious of forms of global governance where power asymmetries are going to be magnified. So there are certain forms of bilateral agreements, particularly on issues like readmission, where I think we should be deeply concerned. And actually, I think from a democratic point of view, I think we should always be concerned about instances where our governments escape domestic accountability mechanisms and then purport to act in our name by reaching agreements in smoke-filled rooms. So, in contrast, some other forms of global governance actually have a modicum of transparency and accountability. And in those fora, you do get more progressive outcomes. And I think one of the most progressive developments at the international level is actually the ILO Convention on Domestic Workers, um, which unsurprisingly, given that the ILO has a very different institutional setup and also has a tripartite structure, which includes not only governments, um, but also um, employers, representatives, and um, workers' representatives in it, produced a convention with some very wise um, and progressive commitments in relation to migrant workers. And interestingly, the UK was one of the few, perhaps the only state that didn't sign and has committed not to ratify that particular instrument. Um, but one of the interesting things that that convention, I think, very clearly identifies is that if we're having a discussion about migration, well, I think we have to decide well, what form of migration we're talking about. And it, can, it can't be dissociated from questions about what these migrants are going to be doing for us. So if a society decides it wants to commodify childcare and to import workers to do that work, you know, that is going to have implications for the nature of that society. One of the interesting things that that convention would not permit is situations where 
the status of the domestic worker would be tied to a particular employer, which is something that is prevalent not only in the UK, but also in Canada and in a number of other liberal democracies. And as a labor lawyer on some occasions, that's something that you know, should make us shudder, I think. So migration controls basically don't always meet their aim, but they do have a huge range of other effects. They have effects internally, they have effects in terms of who looks after our children, they have effects in relation to labor market structures. So they're not just at the edges of society, they reach into societies, and I don't think they can be separated from a whole range of other questions. Um, and similarly, at the global level, I think the difficulty with imagining progressive moves is that one of the things that you have to do to get to some sort of progressive development is to sort of put faith in very informal processes like um, the global consultations on migration and development and so on, um, which tend to lack transparency. And we can maybe perhaps envisage them as a laboratory for more progressive developments. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid I tend to see them more in the vein of smoke-filled back rooms where governments do things that they wouldn't be able to do um, in, the, in the cold light of day. Um, so I suppose in conclusion on the governance side, I mean, I think we have a lot of institutions whose mandates are capable of evolving. And I'm also looking at my colleague Alex here on this point. Um, and, uh, and, and also we have a lot of regional fora that are open and transparent, like the much maligned European Union. So I think there are institutions on which we could build, um, and it probably wouldn't be IOM or, or global or regional consultative processes where we could envisage um, more progressive developments. And recent ILO developments are probably the most hopeful developments in relation to migrant rights that, that I can think of in a long time. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see so many uh, of you here. Uh, Catherine did a great job uh, referencing people's work in the room here. That's not just because she wants to be nice to various people, but it's because Oxford really is one of the, I think, great centers for migration research and debate. Now, I want to spend my 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so to talk a little bit about um, the rights of migrant workers. I work across the economics and politics, and most of my work looks at um, comparative analysis of labor immigration policy and migrant rights around the world. And um, if you look at global governance debates, debates about global governance of migration, um, migrant rights typically um, are at the center of debate. Uh, so most recently we've had a high-level meeting at the UN General Assembly that uh, one, one of its uh, purposes was to try to mainstream human rights into all aspects of the migration debate. And of course that was very timely because it just came after the reports that most of us have read about the exploitation of uh, Nepali workers in, in the Middle East, in Qatar. So on one hand, a lot of these meetings you have UN agencies, a lot of migrant rights advocates call for greater equality of rights for migrant workers, better protection of migrant workers. Now at the same time, however, again within the same meetings, you have different people, mainly development economists, development organizations such as the World Bank or the United Nations Development Program, point out that we should have more labor migration across the world. Particularly, we should encourage high income countries to liberalize low-skilled labor immigration. Why? Because the World Bank claims that there's no more effective strategy for raising wages of workers in poor countries than giving them the opportunity to work in high-income countries. Now, of course, uh, I think I take Paul's point that uh, we're not talking about unlimited migration, and there's different types of immigration that are more beneficial than others, but there's no, there's no debate about the fact that moving workers from low to high income countries is associated with very large benefits for migrants and uh, their families and the, the relationship with development perhaps is more contested. So on the one hand, you have people who say we should better protect migrant workers' rights. The same meeting you have people who say we should have more migration, especially low skilled migration. And the central argument I want to make today, which is based on my book, is that in practice there's a tension between these two goals, more migration and more rights and you cannot always have both. And why is there a tension? Well, if you look at the labor immigration policies of high-income countries, as I have done, you will see that they involve a trade-off between access and some rights. So there are some countries 
that operate what I call high numbers, low rights policies. So the countries in the Middle East are a good example. We've already heard Dubai, but also Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, very large numbers of migrants coming in, but severe restrictions on migrant rights. At the other extreme, you've got Sweden and other countries in Northern Europe who operate low numbers, high rights policies. So Swedish you know, social democratic model insists on equality of rights. So it's very good rights for migrant workers, but Sweden admits very few migrants. So I think there's this tension between these two objectives. And if you accept this tension, this raises then very uh, interesting but exceedingly difficult ethical questions. And as always with the ethical, ethical debate, there's no one right answer. So one, one question, one obvious question is, can we ever justify restricting specific rights for migrant workers in order to facilitate more migration, in order to encourage more high-income countries to admit more migrant workers? And at the end of my 10 min minutes, I will make a normative argument. I will, make, I will give an answer to that question myself, but I hope that even you, if you reject my normative view, you will still um, accept that the trade-off point, the tension between more migration and more rights, is one that we should talk about. And that tension is one that has been completely ignored in global governance debates. UN agencies generally do not want to hear about this. And I think uh, this needs to end and we need to have more open debate. And just stepping back a bit, many of you will know that in 1990, um, we had a UN convention, a human rights treaty on the rights of migrant workers, 1990. Uh, now this treaty has become by far the least ratified human rights treaty in the world. Of all the human rights treaties that, that we've had since the 1960s, we now have fewer than 50 ratifications of that treaty. Fewer than 50 countries have ratified this treaty, almost all of them primarily sending rather than receiving countries, and many of them that have ratified do not have very good human rights records themselves. Now, the response from UN agencies and many migrant rights advocates to the low levels of ratification has been we need more campaigning, and people often emphasize that migrant rights are human rights. And migrant rights have intrinsic value that should be respected regardless of citizenship. My point is that in addition to the intrinsic value that rights have, the rights that migrants are given in receiving countries also play a very important instrumental role in shaping the effects of migration for migrants receiving countries and sending countries. So for example, the extent to which migrants are given access to the welfare state, social housing, education, health, obviously has an impact on the fiscal effects of immigration for the receiving country. Whether or not migrants are given the right to free choice of employment or are tied to specific employers or sectors obviously impacts on their wages and thus remittances. So all rights, in my view, have all kinds of costs and benefits that vary across rights and that vary between the short and the long run. And precisely because rights have consequences, in practice, restrictions of migrant rights are instruments of labor immigration policy. So I think we need to move away from just talking about rights in terms of human rights to a debate and analysis of restrictions of migrant rights as labor immigration policy. So then you ask, well, what's labor immigration policy? Well, I think there's fundamentally three questions that any labor immigration policy needs to address. That is, how open do we want to be? So how do we regulate the scale of immigration? B, how do we select migrants? Do we admit highly skilled workers, low skilled workers, a mix of both? And and third, very importantly, what rights do we grant migrant workers after they have arrived? Do we admit them on a temporary permanent basis? Do we give them access to the welfare state? Do we give them family reunion rights and so on? So these three decisions, openness, selection, rights, are made simultaneously. They're all part of labor immigration policies. So if you want to understand what's going on with migrant rights around the world, you have to also look at admission policies. So the particular question that I've been interested in for the past few years is what's the relationship between these things, between openness, selection, and rights? So what I've done is I've looked at labor immigration policies in 46 high-income countries, and what I found um, was various findings, but I'll just mention four to you which are quite interesting. First of all, most labor immigration programs in high-income countries are guest worker programs, temporary migration <coughs> programs. 90% of labor immigration programs admit migrants, initially at least, on a temporary basis. There's a big literature about the demise of guest worker programs. Um, I think that's just not true. By and large, when we talk about regulating labor migration, we're talking about temporary migration programs. Now, in terms of relationships, what is clear is that high-income countries are more open to admitting skilled and low-skilled migrants. High-income countries give skilled migrants more rights than low-skilled 
migrants. And interestingly, and that's relevant to the debate today, is that there is this tension between openness and some rights that migrants are given. So the more open admission policies tend to be associated with greater restrictions on some rights. Not all rights are involved in this trade offs just those rights that are perceived to create net costs for the receiving country. So if a right, say, take the right to social housing for low-skilled migrant workers, if it's considered costly to grant that right to a migrant worker, then the extent to which the migrant worker will be admitted depends on the extent to which that right can be restricted. And there's lots of examples, if you look at labor immigration policies in practice, where you see the trade-off at work. I'll just give you a couple. For example, in the early 1990s in the US, there was a lot of concern about the fiscal effects of low-skilled <coughs> immigration. So President Clinton instituted the Jordan Commission to look at immigration policy, make recommendations to Congress. Now, one of the key recommendations was to maintain migrants' access to the US welfare state, as it was at the time, but to reduce the scale of immigration. And Congress turned around and did exactly the opposite. Uh, in 1996, as part of a big welfare reform bill, it re reduced temporary migrants' access to the US welfare state, but it's kept, kept numbers high. So reduced, reduced rights, but kept immigration high. In the, United, in, the, in the UK, of course, we all know around East European enlargement, uh, when Britain and Ireland decided to open doors to East European immigrants, so there was no, no policy on restriction the inflow of workers. At the same time, some of the rights, some of the access to social rights was, was tightened up. Now, if we accept there is this tension, I think the interesting question is then, how do we normatively respond to it? So there's this tension between migration and rights. Can it ever be, can we ever justify restrictions of rights in order to generate more migration? Now, however you think about this, I think it's important to consider the interests and actions of migrants, as well as the interests and policies of sending countries. And if you look at sending countries' labor immigration policies, again, you will see that trade-off at work. Most countries' labor immigration policies, where you look at Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Philippines have two objectives. One is send more migrant workers out, and B is protect migrants while they're abroad. When push comes to shove, the objective of sending people out always dominates the objective of protection. And the best example, of course, just recently again, we've all heard again the uh, Nepali workers working under um, very restricted rights and under conditions of exploitation in Qatar. Now what happened? The Qatari and Nepali government gave a joint press conference saying there's no problem. The Nepali government said it's just not true. Now why are they doing it? Well, because the Nepal is very concerned if it becomes too insistent on migrant rights, Qatar will just turn around and say, well, okay, that's fine, we'll just take our workers from elsewhere. And that's precisely why Indonesia, for example, imposes an export ban of domestic workers to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia says, that's fine, we'll just take our workers from Bangladesh. So the the, the trade-off between openness and rights is at work in labor immigration policies as well. There's examples of countries that have explicitly rejected equality of rights of their nationals abroad, arguing that this is a protectionist policy. So when the Latvian construction company goes to Stockholm to build a primary school, bringing its own workers, so when those workers receive less than the collectively agreed wage in Sweden, the Swedish trade unions protest and demand that these workers be paid Swedish workers. Now, from the Swedish point of view, this is an argument for equality and inclusion. From the Latvian point of view, this was a blatant argument for protectionism. Because they say, well, you know, if we need to be paid exactly the same wages and if we need to have all your social rights, we will not be competitive. So I think, you know, one person's argument for inclusion is another person's argument for protectionism. So where I come down on terms of normatively, I, I do think there's a strong case for liberalizing low-skilled labor migration across the world. Um, I think the only way you can do this is through temporary migration programs that restrict a few specific rights that create net costs for receiving countries. Now, the, there is rights restrictions that I personally would find acceptable at a free choice employment unless you restrict that right. You take away a lot of the rationale for bringing in migrant workers in the first place. A lot of high-income countries have shortages in specific sectors, agriculture, IT. They want to use immigration to address these shortages. If migrants cannot be limited to these sectors, then much of the rationale for bringing in migrants goes away. And I would also find um, restrictions on means-tested social rights acceptable. So those are not contributory benefits. So I think it's very hard to argue that you should restrict rights where migrants pay and I think they should get out. But things like social housing, low-income support, I think, uh, these restrictions that are, that, that are really, where well, these rights are really obstacles to more open admission policies, 
I think, are more acceptable. Now, I would personally, again, argue that these restrictions would need to be temporary, and after some time, say four or five years, I think countries need to decide either they grant permanent residence or they require people to leave. What I would personally find unacceptable is to have a policy of permanent second-class status, uh, which is what we see in, in the Middle East. So in a way, um, uh, to conclude and to come back to global governance and the human rights of migrants, I think one, one of the real problems with a narrow-minded human rights approach to migration that's reflected in the UN Convention is that, that a human rights approach is sometimes too much focused on existing on, on protecting the rights of existing migrants without considering the consequences for the admission of new migrant workers. So crudely put, insisting on complete equality of rights for new migrant workers can come at the price of more restrictive admission policies. Again, you've got that trade-off at work. And again, it has not been acknowledged at all in any of these meetings. And I think the way forward would be, after 25 years of UN Convention and countries not ratifying, and there's no realistic prospect of of big high-income countries ratifying. I think it's time to supplement the convention, to complement the convention, with a list of universal core rights, a smaller list, so a list that has fewer rights than the 1990 convention, but that has a higher chance of being accepted by a great number of countries. Now, we can have a debate about what those core rights should be and how do they differ from the complete list. But I think, given that we have this trade-off in high-income countries' labor immigration policies between access and rights. And given that no big immigration country uh, among the high-income countries are ratifying the current convention, I do think there's a very strong case for going down the route of the core rights approach. So somewhat paradoxically, I think, when it comes to the effective protection of migrant workers, uh, less is more. Thank you.